Welcome everyone to DEF CON 28 Hardware Hacking Village Challenge Solves. I'm Rare, a volunteer with the Hardware Hacking Village. In this talk, I'll be doing a walkthrough of one way to solve each of last year's DC 28 HHB challenges. With DEF CON being remote last year, I wanted to find a way attendees could still participate and learn from the Hardware Hacking Village. While hardware hacking has strong physical components, there are still some parts of it that don't require immediate access to hardware, so I wanted to focus on some of those topics. I released five challenges to introduce participants to tools and methods I use when hacking on hardware, and hopefully challenge those people to grow their knowledge of their hardware hacking space. At the end of the weekend, to my delight, we had three participants solve all five challenges, so shoutouts to Nolkasa, MM Doogie, and Captain Sabertooth. Well done, and congratulations again. So the challenges are still hosted on the dchv.org website. So if we navigate there and go to challenges, we can still find them in DEF CON 28 challenge. There we have uh, an introduction. I'll read through it briefly. Welcome to this year's Hardware Hacking Village challenges. We tried to design them for maximum remote fun. Each challenge is a logic analyzer capture. We've taken care of the hard part of capturing signals from suspicious devices, and it will be your job to figure out what secret messages are being conveyed. Challenges are designed to range in difficulty, but difficulty can be relative, so feel free to ask questions in this channel and or join the various HHV challenge chats. Below are the challenges. Be sure to, to read the scenarios for the challenges as they will likely give some clues. Additionally, you will need logic which is software provided by Soleil, to open the challenge files. There may be additional files necessary to solve, and for those challenges, they will be in a zip, they will be zipped together. So the first thing they notice from, I want participants to do from here is download Soleil logic. So we'll go there. Um, at the time of doing these challenges, Soleil Logic 2 was not released, so these are all designed using Soleil Logic 1. So if you're looking to go through and retrace these, make sure you don't download Soleil 2, Logic 2, but you download Soleil Logic 1. I do highly recommend Soleil Logic 2, but for this talk, only Soleil, they were designed only for Soleil Logic 1. So we, after downloading that, uh, we are pretty much ready to get started. So let's dive into challenge one. It's the first challenge. It's meant to be an introduction to both logic and serial communication. So let's read through the prompt. We sniff this capture between two communicating parties. We need help figuring out what was said. We believe a critical key was exchanged. So let's download the challenge and open it with Soleil. We immediately see two channels, and this kind of matches up with what we were prompted with, which is two communicating parties. If we zoom in a little bit further, we'll see there's definitely no, this is not a clocking signal and there's no other clocking going on. So it's safe to assume this is asynchronous. Our first guess would be this would just be two asynchronous serial channels since that's pretty, pretty common and standard. So let's zoom in even further to figure out what the bond rate might be. Since these are two bits and we're seeing it's 4.8 kilohertz, we would think that our baud rate would be double this speed. So we'd have a single clock for one of these single bits. And that would put us at 96 kilohertz. And that's pretty standard for, a, or it's at least a common baud rate for uh, serial communication. So let's go ahead and use our async serial decoder. Since we're using channel zero initially right now, and we want our bit rate to be 9600, uh, we'll leave the rest of this stuff standard and see what comes up. And it looks like we aligned pretty well. We see that all the data is getting clocked properly and we're able to get some data out of it. Let's convert that over to ASCII. And we see hello. So that seems to make sense so far. Let's go ahead to this next bit. Let's just try and see if the same analyzer settings will align with that one as well. So this time we're going to do on channel one and we'll convert that over to ASCII and we see, hey, good to see you. So we can start to go through the communication here. Did you bring that thing? Yes, but this frequency can't be trusted. 
jump to this baud rate times 12. So we know our baud rate is 9600. If we were to multiply that by 12, we get 11. Uh, we get 115, 200. So we can get and see when we, it looks like this is where our baud rate speeds up. So we can see, we know that we can see the individual bits here, but all of a sudden it gets a lot faster here. So let's zoom in there and then let's change this baud rate. So we'll edit the settings on this serial analyzer. And from 9600, we'll go to 115, 200, which would be 9600 times 12. And let's save it. We'll zoom in a little bit closer. And there we go. We have the secret is flag part of a balanced breakfast. And that would be the flag to the first challenge. Now let's take a look at challenge two. We sniffed this capture between a microcontroller and various EEPROMs. Unfortunately, the capture was cut off before you could see the result of the read. Could you figure out what would have been amount from the read? Let's go ahead and download that. And we'll open this challenge with logic. And here we see two channels again. Commonly for, re for interfacing with EEPROMs is to use SPI or I squared C. Now, both of these could look the same where we would see a clock and a data line, but we can also see an extra thing where with I squared C, we would see that data would help be held low while a whole operation was happening between multiple bytes. We also would see the data line drop low and then remain low uh, outside of when the clocking happened. So this t looks a little bit more like I squared C than it would be SPI. Uh, so we'll go ahead and try that first and see if that analyzes. So we have our data line, which would be channel one and our clock line, which would be channel zero. It recommends using 8-bit, but a lot more commonly, I squared C uses 7-bit addressing, where the most significant seven bits would be used for addressing and the least significant bit would be used to signify reading or writing. So let's go ahead and try 7-bit. Great, we see that we have some alignment and we're able to get some data back. Looking here at the side, we can see that we have a write to I squared C address seven, seven, six, six, nine, and if we were to go through this, we would end up seeing that we are writing to six, seven, eight, and nine. So our destination EEPROMs would be on an I squared C addresses six, seven, eight, and nine. Let's figure out what the, the write they were talking about in the prompt was, or what the read was in the prompt. So we know there was a read that was being cut off at the end, and let's zoom in on that. Unfortunately, because this is an incomplete read, we our parser is unable to tell us all the information about it, but we can go through and do this by hand. We know this least significant bit signifies the read or the write. With it being high, that signifies a read. If it was low, it'd be a write, but we know this is a read because it's high. And then let's find the addressing on the most significant seven bits. So we have a zero, a zero, a zero, and then a one. That would signify that we are trying to read from address eight. What we could do then we could go through here and then look for every time that we would see a write to address I squared C address eight. And we can go ahead and change this to ASCII hex so we can see what is being written to that address. So let's go down and find something to address eight again. And here we see what is typical with uh, writing to an EE prom is you would first specify the index and what you want to read to, or what, what you want to write to on the on the EEPROM memory and then you would see the value that you want to write or you want to store. So we would see a write to nine, uh, index nine, and then we'd also see the character in which we want to write to index nine would be a bracket or the, the hex address seven B. We can then see the next instance of this where we'd see again a write to address eleven or to index 11, and then we'd see the value being i. And notice these are out of a line, so what I would, would suspect then is that we are just writing two addresses in no particular order. And see here we have a 22, we're writing a w. So we'd have to go through, if we were doing this by hand, and then lay out uh, 
we could do this in, in some kind of uh, Excel file where we'd write out each character and make sure we keep track of which index it would go into and then read the flag out. We can also script this though. So if we go to here, we can export our search results and we'll export them as chow2.csv. We'll save that and then open it with a text editor. We can see that our that the, the data we have in here aligns very much or exactly with what we were seeing on the left with the exception of we just have a title that is add to the top uh, to, to let us know if we were to open this in Excel or something like that, which, which each of the, the columns pertain to. But we can also now take this script and since we can see the structure of it, we have our rights every where we specify which I squared C address we're writing to every three lines, we can end up scripting this where we look for where we're writing to address eight, and then we can parse the index and the value that we want to store. So let's go ahead and look at the script that we'd write for this. And here we see we're creating a dummy buffer to act as our EEPROM buffer in which we can write to and store in specific store characters at specific indexes. We'll bring that, bring this back up so that we can reference this. And next we have, we're skipping this, the first line, which is just the titles. And then again, like I was saying, we're gonna go through and look for every three lines where we have, where we're specifying which I squared C index we want to interface with. So we'll, we can also go through and look for the first eight one. So we'd end up finding this line eventually, and we're using a regex um, or a regular expression to look for the zero X uh, followed by some numeric value. And then we can change that into an int and compare against that to figure out when we hit eight. When we do hit that, we then look at the next line to parse the index. Again, we use regex to find this value and we store that index uh, to a temporary value. And then we go down and we do the same thing on the following line uh, where we'll parse that. But this time, since we can split this string up based on the comma, we can we'll split this into three different sections and look for the first character of that third section, which will be the character in which we're gonna store. We then store it to our buffer flag and with the, the index specified by what we found in the second line and the character from what we just found in the third line. And then all that's left is to print out that flag. So let's go ahead and run that script. And we'll run that. And we see that the flag is flag I, I, see you know your serial. Two down so far, now let's take a look at challenge three. We snipped another capture between two communicating parties. I think this one has more layers than the previous captures. They must know we're listening. See if you can capture what was exchanged. We'll go ahead and download capture three, and we'll open it with logic. Wow. So this time we see four channels instead of the two that we'd seen in the previous two challenges. Let's zoom in a little bit. This looks a lot more like SPI because um, we can see this channel three seems to be low whenever there's communication going on here, which would point to it being a chip select. Let's zoom in a little bit further. Again, we can see that we have channel zero being this clocking structure, and we look to have a, another data line uh, on channel two. We can then look over to here, and it looks like we also have a data line on channel one as well. And that would, again, point us towards this being SBI, as we would have a, a master out slave in, or a primary out secondary in, and a um, as well as a master in slave out or primary in secondary out. So let's go ahead and take a guess that this is SPI and see what our analyzer comes up with. 
Again, if we're wrong, we just would end up seeing garbage, but let's go ahead and test it and see. It's, not, it's always easy enough to test this. So we have our clock on channel zero. We would then have, since this data, since channel one is being followed up to what happens on channel two, we'll guess that this is the secondary output and these are the primary outputs. So we'll say um, master or primary out is going to be on channel two and the secondary out is going to be on channel one and then that leaves the chip select or the enable on channel three. We'll leave all of this stuff standard for now. Save that and see what we come up with. And here we go. We have what looks to be uh, a lot of exchange from a primary and a secondary. Let's go ahead and export this. Actually, no, first let us switch this over to show ASCII and hex. And we'll go ahead and export that. We'll name this channel challenge3.csv. And then we'll edit this with our, we'll open this with our text editor. All right, now that we have our output in the text editor, we can see again we have our title on the first line. And then what we were seeing in this structure in the back, we see three different bytes. Uh, groups of three bytes together. So we've got, and that kind of follows here. We see groups of three where we have two from the master or the primary, or the primary and then we have a follow-up uh, response from the secondary. And as we go through these groups, oftentimes we see a zero for the first uh, byte being sent out, but then we see a couple where there we see a one that's being sent out in the first byte. We then see a large variety of numbers followed up in the second byte, and it looks like the third byte that's coming from the secondary varies between four different digits. Here we have AF, 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 AF. And then we see a 5C, 5F, AF, AF, 5C, 5F. And if we keep scrolling down, um, we end up seeing a 2F as well. And for the most part, these also align with ASCII characters. We see a uh, a slash there, underscore, and we see another backslash, a forward slash. So the only one that's not being represented is this AF, and that would be because we have a one in the, the most significant spot for the ASCII. Uh, but that still does align with, with ASCII characters, it's just not your standard ASCII set. So we'll go with that. Let's, let's take a look at this script to, to start parsing this. All right, our script is very similar to what we had before. We have a buffer a little bit bigger now to accommodate a larger index range. Uh, we're skipping our first line because it's title. And then because we have groups of three, we're going to enumerate and go through every third. Uh, we'll go through every third line to start. So that way we can just parse the first line, the second line, and the third line uh, in each go. For the first line, we have, we're going to guess is the most significant bit. Uh, we'll go through, parse that value. It's either going to be a zero or a one, and we'll convert that to an integer. We'll then do the same thing for the second. Uh, for the second line, we'll get the least significant byte, and we'll go through and parse that again to an integer. We'll then combine these so that we can create our 16-bit value, which will be our index within the flag. Um, so we'll we'll bring our most significant byte up by eight bits, and then to make room for our least significant byte and combine those together. We'll then go through and parse this third line, which is the response from the secondary, which should be whatever value will be saved in that flag index uh, and one of the, the four values. And since we were seeing characters before, we'll go ahead and we'll store this value as a, a character value. We'll then take uh, at the end We'll store at our flag, our 16-bit flag index, we'll store that character that we have, and hopefully we'll have a flag. Maybe it's, it's ASCII art or something like that. Let's take a look at that. Let's see. Python, chow3. And this doesn't quite look like ASCII art, but it 
does look like something we saw from challenge one. This looks like it could be another serial structure similar to the, the single line asynchronous serial we saw in challenge one. So let's go ahead and pop that into a text document. Now let's go through and parse this. And again, I was hoping this would be some kind of ASCII art, but as we change the width, we don't really see much adjustment. But if this does end up being uh, asynchronous serial, let's go ahead and see. We'd first have this being the start condition where we have a, a low, and then it would be followed up by eight bits. So we have the first, the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. And then we'll go ahead and drop that down. We'll also drop this down just to see if it aligns. So again, we've got our start condition, and then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then we have our stop condition. And this is looking like it, it aligns pretty well to the same structure. So this looks a lot like ASCII, or, or uh, like serial, asynchronous serial. So let's go through and parse one of these. And remember that serial ends up sending the least significant bit first. So this would be our least significant bit and this would be our most significant bit. Um, and since we're gonna write it back in most significant bit order first, we'll go through and parse it from right to left. So here we have a zero and then we see a one, a one, a zero, a zero, a one, a one, and then finally a zero. If we look this by, if we go through and convert this to ASCII, we end up with the value lowercase f. So that's a good start, especially if we're trying to spell out flag. And we'll go through and do the second one. Zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero, zero. Goes through and do that. And we end up with an A. All right, this is still looking promising. We'll go to the next one. Zero, one, one, zero, 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 one. It's an A. And then we got this one. Zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one, one. And that ends up being a G. Oops, a G. Now, if we were to go through and do all of these, we would indeed end up with a flag. And the flag is who needs fancy software or SW. And that is a joke to saying that it is possible to parse this by hand. And hopefully you went ahead and did that, though it is possible to script this as well. Three challenges down, two to go. Let's take a look at challenge four. We found a strange random seven segment display laying around, but it was flashing too fast for us to read it. It looks like a controller was transmitting to a shift register and the shift register was connected to a seven segment display. We were only able to capture the signals latch, clock, and data lines between the controller and the shift register before we heard someone coming. Can you help us decode what was being sent on the seven segment display? Let's go ahead and download that capture. I have also gone ahead and found the data sheet for this shift register that we'll reference shortly. So let's open this capture. We have three signals and three channels like the prompt told us. We'll look at the start. Again, we see this clock structure. We also see something that looks like an enable, which is likely the latch. And then we see uh, some data or some stuff that doesn't really have any pattern to it, which is likely the data line. And we can, we can further confirm that by looking over at the next. We see, again, we have the clock. Again, we have some different uh, highs and lows. So it would probably still be data. And then we have this low that's coming here, which was likely our latch uh, for a shift register. But let's understand a little bit more of a shift register. Let's go jump back over to the data sheet. So I've gone ahead and jumped down to the detailed description on page 12 of this TI data sheet. 
And the important thing to take away from here is this line. Uh, both the shift register clock, SR clock, and storage register clock, R clock, are positive edge triggered. So that is pretty important to know because we want to know when, when um, data is being stored or being, when the clock is being triggered uh, for our shift register. And we learn here that it's positive edge triggered. Let's look a little bit more of the structure of our shift register. So here we have the serial line, which we have. We have the SR clock, which is the shift register clock, and the other thing we have, and then we have R clock, which is the register clock or the latch. What happens with the shift register is we have serial data come in, and so that serial data will be waiting here on 1D. As soon as SR clock goes high, that'll cause this first register to save that data to the register. Um, so if this is a zero, it'll save the zero state. If this is a one, it'll save the one state. And after that, it'll be outputting that on its output down here. Um, that is then fed into the next register or the next level in the shift register. And once again, when another transition, a positive edge trigger comes from the shift register clock, if this was a zero that was previously saved, we'll see a zero here that'll be saved. If this was a one that was previously saved, we'll see a one here. And then this the first register will now accept the, the value of what is currently on the serial. So that'll, if we had a one coming on the serial, we would then save that to the first register on the first clock trigger. Then we'd have a one out. If we had a zero coming in, then on the next register, this would save as a zero. We'd then have a one here on the next clock. Say we have another zero coming on serial. We'd end up with a zero, zero here zero here and the third register the one so it just keeps getting pushed down whatever is happening just slowly trickles down through the shift register once the latch or the the register clock comes in that's when we take the value that was coming out and store that to our output register and that'll be then reflected on the output value so if we were then have this zero zero one come in and we finally get our latch pulse we would then see this one get carried over to the output register, and we'd have a one on QC, zero on QB, and a zero on QA. So let's jump back to our, to our logic capture. All right, so back in our in logic, uh, let's take a look at one of these communications. Again, what we learned in the data sheet was that on a rising edge is where we're going to be having that trigger of saving. Uh, so if this is our, our shift register clock, we would then be clocking uh, as this comes up here and here and here. So we'd have one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero. And then if this is our latch or we would see the latch would be saved here, which would make sense. So we're shifting eight bits in, and then we're gonna latch for our output. A little trick that we can do for parsing this a little bit further is if you remember back to the previous challenge for SPI, we had a clock and we also had a data that aligned. Now we can kind of take, we can take that and use that to parse this a lot faster instead of having to do it by hand. So let's go ahead and take our analyzer for SPI. We'll say that our clock is on zero. Our, well, it doesn't matter which one we use, but we'll just use MOSI for now. We don't have a MISO. And then coincidentally, because our latch is low, that also acts as a chip select. So that works to our advantage as well. So we can set our chip select as two. We don't care too much about the ordering of any of this because we don't know what is what the, the hookup is for to the seven segment display. So let's go ahead and save that. And just like that, we are able to quickly get a lot of values. And as we look through this, we can see you know, there's a bunch of values, but what stands out immediately is the FF. Um, that means that we either have, if this is running to a seven segment display, that means that all of the segments are either on or they're off, depending if it's common anode or common cathode. 
What is unlikely is, since the seven segment display has seven segments and usually a dot to go with it, it would be pretty uncommon to see that dot being illuminated. So what this stands out to me is, is this would be a common an or a common anode configuration so that and whenever we send a low that is when a segment would be on and whenever we send a high that is when a segment would be off so with ff all the segments would be off that also signifies if the segments are off this is going to be likely a space if we're if we're doing some kind of text out on that seven segment display and so we can look through it we see we've got an f there we then go a little bit further. We have an F there. So we've got a space. We've got another short amount and then a space. And we keep looking. And that ends up being, I think, our last space. So that's also fairly peculiar. We have some short segments and then we have a long period of, of signal being sent out that doesn't have a space. And so if we make the assumption that this is this is kind of the end of the road and that whatever we're decoding is the flag, it would make sense that the flag would follow after this since our flag has to be at least, I guess, seven characters if we have a single character flag. We have the F, L, A, G, then we have uh, the one bracket followed by the flag text, which could be a single to however many long we want, and then the ending bracket. And so that would at minimum be seven, which wouldn't fit any of these. So with that assumption, we're gonna go ahead and take a look at this hex 9.5, and we're gonna pull it up in uh, a little image editor that we can doodle in. All right, I've gone ahead and pulled up my image editor. I've also brought in a seven segment display image to compare against and I've changed our hex values over here to binary so we can compare again. So this first one would have been the hex 95 that we are referencing. Let's jump into this. I mean, so the first character we think is an F, so let's go ahead and draw that out using segments A, F, E, and G. And now if we write that out to compare against, we have F and then our hex, our binary would be 1001, 0, 0101. 0, 1, 0, 1. And we know that uses A, E, F, and G. Next up, we would have the L. And for the binary of that, we have 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. And if we go back to, we get rid of the A and the G, and then fill in the D, we end up with the L character. So here we're using D, E, and F. And this is the first case where we can see that we're using a character, we have an overlap of the E and F, which we see with these two zeros, and then we have this other character, and remember the zeros, since we're using a common anode configuration for our, for our seven segment display, the zeros are what is gonna cause the segments to light up, or a low. And then we have this other one, so we know these have to be E and F, because they overlap, and that means this character has to be a D. So we can start filling this in. If we do the position of the bit, we would then, we don't know the first one. The second has to be E or it has to be F. Uh, the third has to be an A or it has to be a G. Uh, again, because if we're, we're gonna go through and process out which ones we've already know, we know these are E and F, so this has to be A, G, or this has to be A, G. Um, we don't know uh, bit four. Um, bit five has to be an E or an F. We then have an A and a G. We don't know seven. And then eight has to be D because that's the only difference. Now, if we look at the next one, which should be an A, we would have one, zero, 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 one. And we can draw that out. using segments E, F, A, B, C, and G. So again, all the segments except for D and the dot. And if we write that, A, B, C, E, F, G. Now, 
we know this is D, so that means this other character has to be the dot. Now let's take a look at our next character, which should be G. Go through and erase this, and then draw our G, which would use segments A, F, E, D, and C. And the binary representation for that would be 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And just to keep checking ourselves, we're using, we have five zeros, which match five segments, so we're all good there. We're using A, C, D, E, and F. And now, this is a chance where we have an A, but we don't have a G. So this is going to tell us which character is the A and which character is the G, as well as we know which character is the D. This would be the D. We know we've got our E and our F, and then that leaves us to know that this is going to be, um, oh, oops, I've got these shifted over one. This should be our A and our G, not that. Um, so we know this then has to be, the, the seventh bit has to be our A, which then tells us that this third bit has to be the G. And the remaining bit that we don't know from this, or that we do know, is then we know this would be the, the C value. So the next character we don't know, we suspect it's going to be some kind of bracket character. But we'll go ahead and give it a question mark for now. We then look over, so we've got F, L, A, G. So now we're looking at this one, be 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. Four characters. Let's go through, clear this out. And this time, we're going to just use what we already know against this, uh, against what we want to know. Uh, so we know dot, this has to be an E or an F, and then have a G. Oh, and then we can also say, since we have A, we know where all the characters are except for one, this has to be a B. So we have G, B, that's either an E or an F, and then C, A, D. Luckily, both of these are on, so we know that both the E and the F are on, and then we also have a D and an A that are on. So that aligns, looks like a bracket. We'll then go on to our next character, so F, L, A, G, bracket. And then we have this next questionable character, which is 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. That sounds familiar. And we look up here, and it is our L. So if we keep doing this, we'll then learn that we have an L, an E, a T, a T, an E. And it's this next character that is going to tell us which is the, the E and which one is the F. So if we trace down here again, we'd end up with the character with the binary 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Now this only uses two characters. We know it has to be a letter. We know it uses the G, so let's, tr let's draw that out. We know use the G, and it either has to be the F or the E. I don't know a character that looks like that would look like this configuration, but I do know this looks a little bit like an R. So I would make the guess that E is the is going to be our second uh, bit here, and that F would be the the fifth one so that we have an R here, because that would also align with this where we'd spell out letter. So we'll change that to an R, and now we finally have our knowns. We know what our alignment is for our, for our bits to the seven segment display. And if we follow all of this, we will end up with the flag that is Flag, letters are hard with seven segments. Last but not least, we have the fifth challenge. 
We found another one of those displays lying around, but it seems this one is a bit more complex. Not only is it a 16 segment display, it seems to have some extra ICs on the board to modify the signal coming out of the controller. Whatever it was displaying was flashing far too fast for us to read. So we quickly did a signal capture, aligning capture channel with the number marked on the PCB silk screen, and got out of there. It seems whoever made that device had fabricated the PCB on a public site, and we were able to retrieve the Gerber files. Can you help us reverse engineer the circuit and recover what was being sent on the 16 segment display? So here is this instance where we have a zip file. We're giving the Gerber files, which is a vector representation of the board layout, and we also have a capture as well. Let's first take a look at the Gerber file that we're provided with. So I'm going to go to an online Gerber viewer site, PCBWay offers one, and then I'm going to bring in my Gerber still zipped up. It will be able to load those and show what the circuit board looks like. So this is a representation of what the circuit board looks like. We can see a lot of traces coming out, running to a few ICs, and then going to this 16 segment display. We also have a bottom view, and we can view all the layers at the same time. All right, I've gone ahead and changed the color, layer color so we can see them a little bit better. Red is for top and blue is for bottom. Looking at the ICs that our traces are going to, we have two different kinds. We have the 74LS86N and we have the 74ALS04N. I pulled up the data sheets for both of them and we can take a look at them. The ALS04 is a hex inverter and we can see for the chip we have an input which is A and we have an output which is Y and this happens six times on the chip. We also have power and ground that are provided to the, the integrated circuit. For the S86, we have a quad two input exclusive OR gate. And I really like this data sheet because it shows how you have the two, which pins the inputs come in and the output pins. So we can see the structure for what we would expect for going in and out of the, the different ICs on this board. We also have our 16 segment display and we're lucky enough to have the numbers provided for that as well, which if we do a little searching on Google, we can end up finding a link to the footprint for this part. And if we blow that up a little bit to read it better, we can see this tells us which segment is on which pin. So we know A is on pin one, B is on pin 18, C is on pin 16 and so on, and how that aligns to, oops, sorry, and how that aligns to the segments around the display. What we can do now is convert the PCB design to a script. So it's just a series of logic operations. We know the output level coming out. We then know the logic that we need to do with these different ICs. For the SO4, we need to provide hex inversion and we know the inputs and outputs of those and where those go. And then for the 86s, we know that we need to do a two input XOR and we know the inputs and outputs of where those go. So let's jump over to the script. What I've done here is start at basic and then kind of build it up from there. So the first things I did was I defined our XOR function and I've defined our invert function. From there, I created simulations of the SO4, six input inverter, where we have each of our inputs, uh, and those would be co correspond with the, the different numbers that we had in, we saw in the data sheet, one through six. And then we also get the outputs out from that, as well as simulating the 86, our quad XOR. So we have our inputs in 1A, in 1B, 2A, 2B, so on, and then we get our outputs as well from those that are our output would be 1Y, 2Y, 3Y, 4Y. With those basics of being able to simulate those logic ICs, we can then run our decode function. So coming in, we're the way I have it set up is we'll enter our we'll enter the data that would be going coming out of the IC. We just check that we've entered enough uh, bits. We can then decode it. So we'll run that value that we entered in, and the value coming in is going to be a 16-bit number. And tracing through the 
tracing through the PCB, we can look really quick back to that. We'd see, for instance, we have data zero coming out and going into 1A of our XOR and then coming out, and then we'd see the 1Y flow into the quad XOR. And we can do that with all of these, where we can look at what each of these pins are, where we're getting being provided a pin from. And I've gone ahead and done that, where I've just plugged all of that in and created all of the inner workings of what the logic would be for the PCB. We then get our output. Unfortunately, this is not in the same order that we would expect for the to align with the ABC segments of the 16 uh, segment display. So I then plug this into a fixed pin order where we have this would be the order that we're getting out of this decode function, AMK and so on. And then we align that to what I, we would want to see, which would be A, B, C, D. So we know A is coming from the first value. We then know B is coming from the last value. So we have the 15 there. C is coming from the third to last value. So we've got the 13 there and so on. So this corrects the whole order. And what we're provided with is a printout of A through U for the segments. And then underneath we have a one or a zero to whether or not those will be on or off. One mistake I noticed when I was doing this is that I have laid this out as if it was a common cathode, but in fact, this design is a common anode. Um, so I apologize for that. I was not able to simulate this hardware, but there was a mix-up where um, the zeros, similar to challenge four, zeros should correspond to a um, zero should, according to the part, correspond to um, an on of the segment. But in reality of this challenge, a one corresponds to the to an on for the for the segment. So let's run this script. Let's go ahead and run this script. So the first thing we expect is our value. I'm going ahead and use the annotation in Soleil to uh, align a marker with the different data positions of the parallel data that we would expect coming out of our microcontroller. So A1 corresponds to the first, uh, the first parallel output. And so we can go through and type that in. So we have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1. We do that, and we end up with an output here. If we pull back up our image editor, I've loaded in a new image um, for, I loaded, loaded in an image of our 16 segment display. I'm gonna go through and trace this out. Let's see, we would have an A, a B, we then have E and F, and then we have M and S. So our first character is I. If you were to go through and keep doing this for every parallel, you would end up with the text, I hope no one can see this, followed by the flag, flag, so much room for alpha noom activities. Thank you all for watching. I hope you're able to follow along, but if you have any questions, please reach out in the HHV chat and the DEF CON Discord. Also, all the scripts I've shown, along with the challenge write-up details, can be found on the HHV's GitHub account under the account DCHHV. Again, I'm Rare, and I hope to see you all again soon. Stay safe and happy hacking.